It's hour number two live right here on the early line on Sports Grid on this Monday all across the Spiz Grizz Network. He is Donnie Wright's side. I am Ben Stevens. In this second hour, we look at where the market now stands in all the madness in the month of March for the 2024 Men's NCAA Tournament, which is 16 teams remaining out of the field of 68 into the Sweet 16 we go. The national championship odds in the early lines here on the uh, early line that's the name of this show for the second weekend of the NCAA tournament we start going around the association as well a ton of hoops into this second hour yeah it should be a good one to watch it play out because if you forgot what was happening in the NBA that's our job here about on a Monday morning to keep you updated on the playoff races and what makes a lot of sense moving down the stretch we understand that the people yeah. want to talk about the sweet 16 and the elite eight we got every if you're a basketball fan Ben we got you covered here hour number two and hour number three coming up every team in the NBA has played at least 70 regular season games most have played 71 a few have already played 72 so everybody around the NBA only has 12 games or less remaining in this regular season. We have said since the All-Star break in Indianapolis, listen, this is the home stretch that even intensifies here now into the final week in the month of March. The playoffs very much on the horizon in the association, play in tournament positioning, postseason positioning as well we will look back on a sunday night in the association in a moment first we welcome in our sports grid radio audience hour number two of the early line here on this monday sirius xm channel 159 all of our radio terrestrial affiliates now in the fold as well he is donnie i am bet marquee matchup yesterday between the two teams that sit in the two spot in their respective conferences milwaukee but they trail Boston by 11 games. The Celtics have won nine straight. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. And Oklahoma City, but the Thunder now only a half game behind the Denver Nuggets for that top spot in the Western Conference. As OKC goes to Milwaukee yesterday, but not really able to keep it close. 118-93, the victory for the Bucks. They win this game by 25 points. They cover as a two-and-a-half point home favorite. How about this? 34 minutes played for Giannis Antetokounmpo. Only finishes at a plus 7, but he has 30 points and 19 rebounds. That's the way you want to lead your team at this point. We take a look at Shea Gilgis-Alexander on the opposite end. A very un-Shea Gilgis-Alexander game. Only 12 points scored. We expect him to be around 30 every game. And quite frankly, 118-93, to 93, even if he would have scored 30 points in this game, wouldn't have had any difference here. Big time win for Milwaukee as, again, we wait. For Damian Lillard to be his Damian Lillard self only scores 11 points in that game, four of 12 from the field over 33 minutes. Thank goodness they got Giannis, who's playing at an MVP level right now. Big win. Certainly are. The Bucs have won 11 of their 15 games since the All-Star break, playing a lot better basketball. But they still trail the Celtics for that top spot in the Eastern Conference by 11 games. The good news for Milwaukee, the Cavaliers have lost three in a row, separating a little bit between the two seed and the three seed in the Eastern Conference. Milwaukee, a three-game advantage. Again, because of the loss, Oklahoma City, a half game behind the Denver Nuggets. The Nuggets are 14-2 and two since the all-star break they have won three straight games so as we look at other action in the association philadelphia concluding a west coast trip in los angeles they played the lakers the other night lost by seven did cover by the hook as a seven and a half point underdog yesterday getting nine points on the road in los angeles against the clippers and the sixers went out right by 14 121 107 Former Clipper Tobias Harris chipping in with 24 points along with Tyrese Maxey, but also maybe the guy coming off the bench. Campaign, 24 minutes, 8 of 15 from the floor, which included five made three-point shots and 23 points off of the bench. The Philadelphia 76 are still trying to scrape and claw to try to stay inside that yeah. top six. They've fallen out of that top six, but getting good news about Joel Embiid possibly coming back. This is an interesting team to watch that's just trying to float here and pick up every win they can. I didn't think they would get any win going out to Los Angeles. So getting that one and one, that's a big number here for the Sixers, picking up that dub moving forward. But also, where does that leave the Clippers at this point? Come on, Clips. Yeah. You're supposed to win this game going away. The Clips now just eight and nine since the All-Star break. They've only covered five times in their previous 17 games, and they've gone over in six of the last eight. The reason I highlight that is we've seen a really strong trend since the All-Star break in the NBA 
to the unders. That's what you expect more meaningful basketball in the regular season with the playoffs on the horizon. Those totals that are normally 230 plus start to make their way down. Not the case for the Clippers in not playing good basketball. They're five and a half games back of Denver for that top spot. They're four and a half games back of Minnesota. The T-Wolves, the three seed in the West right now. The Clippers, the four seed in L.A., only a half game advantage over both the Pelicans at this moment, just the Pelicans at this moment. If that were to flip, New Orleans could potentially host that opening round playoff series against the Clippers instead of that game being in L.A. Western Conference matchup last night in the Twin Cities and the Timberwolves win 114-110 over the Golden State Warriors. 23 points out of Anthony Edwards, 20 points, 12 boards for Nas Reed. He hits six triples. The T Wolves win by four at home. Time is slipping away right now in the Golden State Warriors. Before the season, we were talking about which teams we liked and disliked here, and it looked like at the start of the season, for me, the Golden State Warriors were a great play on the under team total. Then they sort of found their wings. I'm like, oh, no, they might be able to win 50 games. Doesn't look like that's going to be the case here now as the Golden State Warriors take that loss. But look at the standings. One of those things, Ben, that we talked about in the Western Conference, everybody set in stone, 1 through 10, just a matter of where they find out. Only to find the Houston Rockets, 9-1 and one, yeah. including in their last 10, including eight straight victories. Now only one game behind the Golden State Warriors. If you watch that post-game press conference yesterday by Steph Curry saying like, look, man, we're on the wrong side right now. We got to clean things up quickly. Otherwise, nobody's going to care. We're going to get left out of the top 10. Didn't see that coming. But now all of a sudden, the Warriors, meaningful basketball down the stretch, not for seeding purposes, but for playoff purposes. Didn't see that one coming a couple weeks ago. The you. Yeah, the Houston Rockets, a 6-1 to one price now to make Crazy. the play in tournament only, trailing Golden State by a game. Of course, Houston has won eight straight. Minnesota's won five of their last six, by the way, and they've covered in six consecutive games. Yesterday, just a point-and-a-half, two-point favorite at home against the Dubs. Final game for the association from Sunday's action to look at. What a high-scoring affair it was in L.A. The Lakers score 150. The Pacers score 145. It was the most points L.A. has seen in nearly four decades as a franchise. They win by five at home. Yeah, look at that. Look, tempo and tempo. You know the Lakers will engage tempo if you play it. We know that Indiana yep. loves to play at a high tempo. Anthony Davis, the guy that we used to call street clothes here, not in street clothes in this performance yesterday on Sunday 36 and 16 for the big man this is the top of the food chain here right now for the Lakers can they hold on they'll be a fun team to watch in the playoffs with that extended rest in round number one if they get there nearly 300 points so no surprise last night's total of 239 does go over the Lakers over in six of their last eight games eight of their last 11 as well where is the market move in the chase for a national championship we discuss next Mm -hmm. Hey, this is he's on right. the wing. Yeah, but he's back. He pounds in. He's throwing that's elbows, that's a man, too. That's a man move. That's All a right. grown man move, but he's throwing elbows. Ah, oh, the steal. Ah, oh, the foul. Oh, no oh. call. No <laughs> call. But look the Silver was. Fox missed another one. Oh, the humanity. Oh, in the corner. Caleb Love, the arms are up. Oh, Come on, I haven't had a touch in a minute. Betting above the rim. Only on Sports Grid. Betting in game, there's a big difference, right? Like the the computer changes the number so often. Like I tried to get this in right now, but in reality, as I saw plus one sixty five in the arena, they're hitting the shot, and I'm getting this like a couple of seconds late. And even the sports book, like technology, can only like travel so fast. Sports rage late night, only on Sports Grid.
Your gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on sports grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All you've heard me say on the network is, you're either winning in game live all access nobody has been more profitable as a dog than shock the smart team winning back-to-back road games i, I don't care if they're playing topeka high i i wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever in game live prime time back-to-back just utterly stinker quarters in game live overtime honestly as, as you sit here and listen watch right now you may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. Let's reset where the market is ahead of the Sweet 16 in the 2024 Men's NCAA Tournament, where the numbers were to cut down the Nets as a national champion pre-tournament to where they are now with only 16 schools left in the chase for that national title. We start by showing you just the national championship odds after the opening weekend of the 2024 men's NCAA tournament and what we still have to come. Of course, it should be no surprise to see the reigning national champs UConn with an even shorter number now than where they were before the tournament began. Plus 210. Houston's second best price, but back by three bucks, plus 550. Purdue at six to one, Arizona eight to one, and Tennessee rounds out the top five at 12 to one. DRS, as you look at the 10 best prices to win a national championship, before we get into the odds movement, what stands out to you first? I guess it might be North Carolina moving up because how impressive they looked here so far early. It looks like, you know, the ACC also now getting a bump because apparently they were a very good basketball conference, unlike what I thought they were, and just top-heavy with Duke and North Carolina throughout the season. But for my money here, you're looking at UConn here at that plus 210 price. The reason why Houston and Purdue can't move down that low is because Connecticut has looked unbelievably dominant in the regular season, yeah. in the conference tournament, and now here in March Madness. So if you're expecting Houston to drop like a 3-1 to price or a 4-1 to price after the first two games, that's not going to happen, number one, because obviously to win a national championship, if UConn meets you with the national yeah. championship, that's going to be tough to do. But I look at it as saying, Connecticut, Purdue, and Houston keep winning here. They're not going to move all that much from here on out. You're looking at that second wave, who, quite frankly, for myself, the Iowa States and the Creightons of the world haven't moved all that much either yeah. because, again, how dominant Connecticut has been here just holding that top spot. You can't move these teams around all that much seeing what UConn is doing and what their price point liabilities are moving forward. It is really interesting because of all the chalk that we saw this weekend. Of course, only two seeds lower than the five line. Clemson, the six in the West. NC State, the 11 in the South. Advancing to the Sweet 16. All of the four one seeds. All the four two seeds into the second weekend. Where the numbers have gone. What stands out to me is twofold, Donnie. The numbers that have grown shorter in the most movement we have seen in a positive way. And like you said, the Iowa States and the Creightons of the world who look really good in the opening weekend and yet have not seen their price to win a national title really changed all that much. We'll show you where the market has moved the most. A dollar and a half plus a dollar and 60 taken off UConn's price plus 370, the shortest number before and the shortest number now at plus 210. Houston, steady, 
plus 550. A dollar off the number of Purdue, four dollars off the price of Arizona. The Cats now into triple digits. There were only three teams before the big dance got started with three digits in their national championship price. Tennessee shorter by five bucks. North Carolina shorter by four bucks. And Marquette has seen ten dollars of movement off its number. Let's start at the bottom of this list, DRS. Do you think ten dollars for Marquette? Also has to do with the idea that Tyler Kolick is in, he is healthy, he is available, and he looks like his former self, the Big East Player of the Year two years ago. Oh, 1,000%, because you're heading into the tournament yeah. and Marquette wasn't on that normal odds line that we thought they should be on. Let's just say Tyler Kolick plays down the stretch. Maybe they beat UConn down the stretch. Maybe they win the Big East tournament. But obviously we couldn't factor that in because Kolick didn't play at all. Still, they played good basketball. But also, when you're saying, all right, even if Shaka Smart says he's coming back for the tournament, we don't know if that's coaches speak where, yeah, he's going to be in uniform. We'll see what we get out of him. Yeah. The minute that we end, and let's just say we lose, in March Madness, he's going to get surgery on that core abdominal injury. No, he looks every bit as healthy as he was for most of that regular season. That's why it's the biggest drop-off here. Number one, they're winning basketball games in advancing, which automatically is going to drop your price. But now you get to look at Kolick looking like he's the Kolick we saw throughout the season in the Big East. That's why that big drop yeah. there from that 25-1 to 1 down to 15-1, to 1, and I agree with that. If you were willing to take Marquette yeah. pre-draw here in March Madness, hoping that he was going to be good, you got yourself a really good right. discount and good for you for taking that. And you would also look at the path for the Golden Eagles. They see NC State in the Sweet 16. Now the Wolfpack are rolling. Marquette just a six and a half point favorite for the Sweet 16 on Friday night, but it's not a Kentucky team that was the three seed in the South region. $10 off the price of Marquette, a six and a half point favorite against NC State. They would face off against the winner of a great game in the South region at the top of the bracket. That is Houston as the number one seed in the South taking on Duke, a four and a half point spread in favor of the Cougs. No movement on that price for Houston DRS at plus 550. Now you mentioned Connecticut, but Connecticut's on the other side. Houston would not face UConn until a national championship game, and they wouldn't be plus 550. So why do you believe the price hasn't moved on the Cougars? I just feel that when you're in that, there's very little margin to move these numbers once you get under a 10 to 1, right? Like, let's just say how good Marquette mm -hmm. is playing at a 15 to 1. Like, they weren't going to move up to a 4 to 1 because Kolek looked great. You sort of have to also remind ourselves the sports book is trying to balance some things out as well. I'm sure their liabilities are massive on UConn, but also at the same time, it doesn't mean like you're just going to give discounts on everybody else across the board just because you want UConn and drop yeah. them to a my, or plus, or let's just say a minus 180 price, which would be ridiculous at this point, but just hear me out on this but factoring in the way Houston has played and also one of those teams that said look if they're going to win a national championship you're still going through Connecticut but also you got a tough seed that's coming up now that maybe you didn't think was so tough in Marquette who might wind up there in that elite eight game before yeah. you get to the final four there's a lot of things to go through but you're just looking right now and just the early premises UConn looks like they're unbeatable which this isn't a surprise it was like oh Ben you know what Slow regular season, uh, knocked out early in the Big East tournament. Now, hey, look, UConn looks like a good team. Like, no, from start to finish, UConn has been the best team overall and the national championships from the previous year. Yeah. So those other favorites, again, aren't going to move all that much because of how good UConn is. Now, if UConn does get upset here, let's just say, by San Diego State, watch out on everybody's numbers changing drastically yeah. because now the big dog is out of the tournament and it becomes a free-for-all. Really good point there, too, DRS. If there is an upset of UConn, given how short mm -hmm. Connecticut is relative to the field, again, plus 550 for Houston, sure, the number has not moved, but there is a $3 gap, a greater than $3 gap between UConn, the favorites, and the Cougs, the second best price. You feel for San Diego State, number has not changed. 75 to 1 pre tournament to win the national title, still plus 7,500 national championship game rematch from a year ago. The longest prices of the teams that have reached the second weekend before the tournament and now are, of course, the two lowest seeds. NC State 250 to 1 pre big dance to win the national championship, 120 to 1 at this moment. I will tell you this. A number that really catches my eye is Clemson, 120 to 1 before the tournament, now 85 to 1. I have faded Clemson in both of their opening two games. I thought New Mexico was going to do some work here in the big dance. 
wrong. I thought Baylor would handle its business against the Clemson team that is incredibly balanced and really offensively, but allows you to shoot the three if you want. And Baylor shoots the three, fifth most efficient offense, third best three-point shooting team entering yesterday, of course, only 25% from deep. I think Clemson DRS is certainly going to put Arizona on upset alert on Thursday night in the Sweet 16. It could be crazy to watch, and we've seen games where Arizona didn't bring their A game to the table and got beat out in the Pac-12, and also how crazy would that be in the West where you get to an Elite Eight matchup and it's two ACC teams where you know Carolina probably, and again, they still have to play it out, is the better team against Alabama, and if they match up against Clemson, trust me right now, there's no bigger ACC team with the pom-poms out there in North Carolina saying, look, handle Arizona, because that matchup toe-to-toe with those athletic teams here might be a little bit of a washout, but I do think Carolina has an advantage over Clemson, but I Having said that, this isn't just a one-off with Clemson. They did some damage to get to Carolina, and they're not going to shy away from Carolina. That's two teams that know each other well in the ACC. Let's see how it goes out that way. Second game of February, Clemson went into the Dean Dome in Chapel Hill and knocked off North Carolina outright. What a game that would be. But before we get there, it's the Sweet 16, and Clemson and Arizona are the first game of the second weekend. We preview Thursday night slates with those early lines on the early line next. He pounds in. He's throwing that's a, elbows, that's a, man, that's a man move. That's uh, a real man move, but he's throwing elbows. Ah, oh, the steal. Oh, the foul. Oh, no oh. call. No call. <laughs> but look the who Silver was. Fox missed another one. Oh, the humanity. Oh, in the corner. Caleb Love, the arms are up. Oh, Come on, I haven't had a touch in a minute. 25. Betting above the rim. Only on Sports Grid. The betting in game, there's a big difference. Right, like the the computer changes the number so often. Like I tried to get this in right now, but in reality, as I saw plus one sixty five in the arena, they're hitting the shot, and I'm getting this like a couple of seconds late. And even the sports book, like technology, can only like travel so fast. Sports rage late night only on Sports Grid. Gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on sports grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. And New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. Sports grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game time decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All you've heard me say on the network is you're either winning or you're rebuilding. In-game live all access. Nobody has been more profitable as a dog than Shaka Smart teams. Winning back-to-back road games. I, I don't care if they're playing Topeka high. I, I wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever. In-game live. Prime time. Back-to-back just utterly stinker quarters. In-game live. Overtime. Honestly, as, as you sit here and listen, watch right now. You may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. (laughs) 
During that commercial break, live right here on this Monday on the early line, I was already getting my first bets in early for the Sweet 16. We've got three days off until Thursday evening when we will see the West Regional Semifinals and the East Regional Semifinals as well. West Regional games played out in Los Angeles at Crypto.com Arena. East Regional Semifinal games and that final in Boston inside TD Garden where Connecticut does not have to travel very far on their chase for a second consecutive national championship. But we start in the West Region with the night cap on Thursday that would be Alabama and North Carolina UNC has looked really strong in its opening two performances as the one seed in the West region they took care of Wagner as you would expect them to do against the 16 seed winning by 28 and down by double digits early in the opening half against Michigan State on Saturday when some thought that Sparty might keep it close UNC showed its might to win by 16, 85, 69. Now North Carolina remains a three and a half point favorite for the Sweet 16 against the Crimson Tide. And take a look at that total. Once again, 173 and a half, the same number Alabama had in its opening round game against Charleston. That was the largest total DRS we had seen in over two decades in the NCAA tournament. And not just the biggest by a point or the hook, but the largest by at least four points since the year 2000. It should be a great game overall. And also, we have to remind ourselves, and I always bring up this point where when you think about teams like North Carolina, it's usually the offensive end, which they're very good, 16th in the country here in adjusted efficiency. But if we take a look at the yeah. defensive end, they're top 10 on defense, which is exactly what you need. If you're a tempo team and still in the top 10 in defense, that is absolutely tremendous, which UNC is because Alabama is a top five offense in the country as well. Mm-hmm. So that toe-to-toe matchup this is going to make some sense and be a lot of fun. But also, if we're breaking it down to the numbers that make sense. UNC is very good throughout on defense. We know Alabama, top 20 in the country at firing from three-point range. However, UNC does a pretty good job at chasing you off of the three-point line, Ben, and also defending the three-point line. So then you switch up and say, okay, well, Alabama can possibly go inside against Baycott. I don't think that's going to be the case either. Top 25 and two-point field goal percentage is UNC's defense. And if you take a look at the point distribution from Alabama, how about this, Ben? 349th in the country at scoring inside the three-point line. That's not their bread and butter. So conversely, you flip over over and take a look at UNC's offense, which is very good also. They don't turn the basketball over. They rebound extremely well. And here's the the key indicator. In the SEC, you're going to play a lot of defense, and you're going to get a lot of fouls. You look at Alabama's defense, 327th at fouling. You take a look at Carolina, who can get to the free throw line. The advantages here for me early are going to point towards North Carolina in this game, Ben. Yeah, I completely agree, DRS. I don't really have an issue laying three and a half with UNC yeah. at this moment. A really good team keeping their opponents off the offensive glass. and In, in, in fact, mm-hmm. third best in the country. And Alabama takes 46.6% of their shots from three. It was one of the reasons I looked at the total last night between Grand Canyon and Alabama and said to myself, GCU, great defending the three-point line, running you off the three-point line, and GCU's opponents don't score a lot of their offensive output from three. 36.5% of the overall points that the Crimson Tide score come from deep. That is top 40 in the country. UNC mirrors what GCU does, at least metrically, in terms of containing the three-point shot. It would make sense to me right now to early lay three and a half points with North Carolina. Mm-hmm. It would make sense to me right now to go under 173 and a half. Despite North Carolina DRS going over in five of its last six games, if they want to win this game and win it by a comfortable margin, I believe that total has to stay under. It probably does have to stay under, but also- so if you're looking from a way to say, you know, I don't want to lay points, which pre- pretty much is me in the tournament, I probably look towards a maybe yeah. North Carolina team total to the over. Now, also, if you're looking for a team total over, that probably means the game goes over itself. But two of the metrics that I do like to look at, number one, is tempo and how quick you are at the shots. Both of these teams really get up and down the court. But also keep in mind, when the defenses don't force turnovers, what does that mean? More offensive selection, more offensive shots. Alabama doesn't turn the basketball over a lot. Carolina, 310th in the country, Ben. 
and it turning you over, which is bad. You take a look at Alabama's defense, 277 in the country, but also turnover percentage for the offense for UNC, 22nd in the nation, which means they don't turn the basketball yeah. over. So I'm interested to see, I'll put it this way, if I had to bet right now, team total over UNC, yeah. and I would take the minus three and a half for UNC. I believe right now they're the better basketball team. Yeah, when you look at where things stand, that's the 1-4 matchup in the West region with a spot in the Elite Eight on the line. We go to the first game up in the West region. It's the first of four on Thursday to start the Sweet 16 in Los Angeles, Arizona, and Clemson. 2-6 matchup. Line changing as we speak. Six and a half points spread in favor of the Cats at the Open. Now seven and a half points in favor of Arizona. I've been looking for opportunities to fade Arizona in the NCAA tournament. I've already faded Clemson on both of its occasions so far in the big dance, and it hasn't worked well for me. I might look at this spot against a really balanced Clemson team that has looked great so far in this NCAA tournament. Yeah, and also you take a look at here, maybe it's more of a home court advantage if you look at it for Arizona closer in proximity for than sure. Clemson. Obviously, probably a bigger basketball fan base for Arizona than Clemson already. So something to play into. We saw a lot of that this weekend. Watching that Purdue game, Ben, you could have struck and said, hey, this might be on campus at Purdue of how loud that arena was. Not saying the Arizona crowd will be that loud, but certainly a distinct advantage and also playing on your own time schedule there in Arizona to California as opposed to East Coast time zone with Clemson. But if you're looking at Arizona's defense, here's what it's tough because I didn't like the Pac-12 all that much this year, top to bottom. But the one thing that does stand out is when you have a top 10 offense and a top 10 defense on the same side and that much athletic ability, it's hard to knock off Arizona. But also looking at this game where Styles makes some fights here, I think they're pretty good matchups yeah. here, Ben, on both sides to get some points. Because what do we usually look for? One team that loves the three-point shot and that's the only way they can score going up a team that goes, you're not going to shoot the three-point shot, so good luck getting to the paint and laying it in and getting fouled, which you don't do. We look at some of these offensive numbers both teams decent shooting free throws obviously top 10 for Clemson that should help them out but having said that Arizona doesn't foul all that much and neither does Clemson so maybe those extra points don't happen at the free throw line but from a three-point structure and a two-point structure for both of these teams they're about average on both sides so if I'm leaning early in the week it's not really with Arizona or Clemson I actually think we get points in this game I like the over early in the week between Clemson and Arizona both teams have gone under in each of their two games so far in the NCAA tournament. In fact, Clemson under in nine of its last 12 games. It's how they really slowed things up against Baylor, a good three-point shooting team yesterday. And Baylor will take the three. Clemson will allow you to take the three. Arizona doesn't really look for the three. Only 33% of its shots coming from beyond the arc, but maybe that's an adjustment in these next three days that Tommy Lloyd and Arizona will look to do because they have the 16th fastest tempo in all of college basketball. They want to get up and down the floor. Now we go out to the East region. In Boston, first game up inside TD Garden. It's the last game that we saw last year in men's college basketball at the D1 level. That was the national championship game, Connecticut victorious over San Diego State. Now they get to do it again. UConn a nine and a half point favorite against SDSU for this national championship rematch. The total stands at 135 and a half. This is tied for the largest spread that we have into the round of 16. DRS like the national title game last year in Houston. Do you think we see a similar script this time between UConn and San Diego State? Uh, yeah, I don't know if we get a blowout in this game. I like the way San Diego State just played in their previous game, but of course, Connecticut's going to be riding that high, and that's reflected in that price point. San Diego State's a good ball club, still getting 10 points on what is thought to be a neutral court here, when we know it's going to be a pro-Connecticut crowd. However, you take a look at some things that San Diego State does well, they're a good defense, top 10 nationally in adjusted efficiency, but UConn even best yeah. them at eight. And then to go ahead with UConn's top two offense here, they're going to be a really tough out. But the one thing I do like, and I'll probably focus on for my myself instead of taking a side I've been doing very well in this tournament here doing matchups here and taking player props particularly from three-point range yeah. and if one team doesn't like three-point range then you flip it over to points scored maybe around 10 or 15 points per player that you want to pick out but for me for Connecticut again you're going up against a very good defense that does play the three-point line well percentage-wise then top 25 in the country San Diego State but they will let you shoot yeah. the three-point shot the one thing we know about Connecticut they're a good three-point shooting team as a whole 53rd in the country and also top 100 in firing from three-point range. So my early angle for this week is going to be to take a look at Connecticut from the perimeter going up yeah. against San Diego State. 
Two slow tempos, line working as we speak to 10 and a half in favor of UConn. Of course, they have won all eight of their games in the NCAA tournament the last two years by at least 13 points, including last year's national championship game against these Aztecs, 76 59. The closing number consensus around the market six and a half, seven points over under 132. Connecticut here has an advantage in terms of what the spread expects now. Now up in double digits, laying ten and a half, and the total up by a few points as well. Both teams slow paces. Really good defensively. UConn much more efficient offensively than San Diego State, although we saw the Aztecs find a spark last night against Yale. We'll have more of this preview DRS on the other side, but what a great matchup we have in the finale in the East region on Thursday. Illinois-Iowa State, 2-3 matchup at the bottom portion of that bracket. The Illini and the Cyclones. Illinois, best offense in the country. Iowa State, Best defense in the country, and it's a two and a half point spread. Look at the numbers right now. 145 and a half is that total. That's a large total for Iowa State, not as large for the Illini. We'll look at this game and break it down on the other side of the break. That's the nightcap that we have on Sweet 16 Thursday night. That game in Boston inside TD Garden. Plenty more to come. The early lines. For the Sweet 16, on the early line. Illinois, Iowa State, and then the four games we have on Friday on the other side of the break. He's on right. the wing. Yeah, but he's back. He pounds in. He's throwing yeah, elbows, that's a man, too. That's a man move. That's right. a grown man move, but he's throwing elbows. Ah, oh, the steal. Oh, the foul. Oh, no oh. call. No <laughs> call. But look the Silver was. Fox missed another one. Oh, the humanity. Oh, in the corner. Caleb Love, the arms are up. Oh, Come on, I haven't had a touch in a minute. 25. Betting above the rim. Only on Sports Grid. For betting in-game, there's a big difference. Right, like the, the computer changes the numbers so often. Like, I tried to get this in right now, but in reality, as I saw plus 165, in the arena, they're hitting the shot. And I'm getting this, like, a couple of seconds late. And even the sports book, like, technology can only, like, travel so fast. Sports Rage Late Night, only on Sports Grid. gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on sports grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. Sports grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All you see on the network is you're either winning or you're rebuilding. In-game live all access. Nobody has been more profitable as a dog than Shaka Smart team. Winning back-to-back road games. I, I don't care if they're playing Topeka high. I, I wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever. In-game live. Prime time. Back-to-back just utterly stinker quarters. In-game live. Overtime. Honestly, as, as you sit here and listen and watch right now, you may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid.
A matchup I cannot wait for. It's the finale in the nightcap of the four games that we have on the opening day of the Sweet 16 on Thursday. It's the best offense in the country. That would be Illinois into its first Sweet 16 since 2005 against the best defense in the country. That would be Iowa State. 2-3 matchup in the East region inside TD Garden in Beantown on Thursday. It's now a two and a half point spread in favor of the Cyclones. That over under 145 and a half. So Donnie on one side again for Illinois best offense in the land on the other side best defense in the land for Iowa State. What do you think wins out? Look a famous group once said this Ben. I'm going to let me just let me get my pitch right here. <clears throat> yeah. One on one. I want to play that game tonight. That's Hall of Notes and say why is this thing in Hall of Notes early on a Monday morning. Number one in offensive efficiency Illinois. Number one in defensive efficiency, Iowa State. And I love this game because you should say this. Other, ooh, they're going to cancel yeah. each other out. I love this game from a prop perspective and hear me out. And granted, this is the first time. That's what I love about Monday morning, right? I haven't looked at these games. I haven't yeah. handicapped them yet. And I can just pull up the numbers right away and go, this could be my game of the week. And quite frankly, I won't even get to watch it because it's going to probably tip at 10.30 p.m. But trust me on this one. Here's what we love. You say, you can't go against any of the offensive metrics going against the number one defense, Donnie. It's going to cancel each other out. Look at this. 354th in the country at running you off of the three-point line is Iowa State. So you know where your boy's going right away. The three-point line for Illinois. Then let's flip it over and say, well, Iowa State, not really known for their offense, but still top 40 in the country, going against a decent defense in Illinois. Look at these numbers. Top seven in the country at running you off the three-point line is Illinois. So we're not going anywhere near that. We're going to take a look at guys no. like Lipsy to get busy with 10 to 15 or maybe 20 points. Why? Eighth in the country at letting you score inside the arc is Illinois. So we're going from behind the arc here with Illinois to inside the arc with Iowa State. I can't the same game parlay is going to be outrageous, Ben, for this game for me. I love that for you. Illinois has gone over in both of its games here in the NCAA oh. tournament. Went over in all three of its games on its way to winning the Big Ten tournament title as well. In fact, the Illini have gone over in 14 of its last 16 games. Iowa State, on the other hand, we saw a total of 128 and a hook the other night in Omaha in the round of 32, and that game still stayed under. It's a really good point, DRS, 58% of the offense that the Illini allow this year have come from inside the arc. Illinois is the best defense or best offense in the country rather, but the 92nd best defense, they are not good on that end of the floor. Does Iowa State have enough offensively to keep pace? Because despite the Cyclones being great, a couple of the metrics are interesting. They let you shoot the three. Illinois doesn't really want to shoot the three. Terrence Shannon Terrence Shannon Jr. is like a running back when he goes down the lane. It is hard to stop him from getting to the cup. Dame Danger has been fantastic. Marcus Damask is working things around. But Illinois can't shoot the three. It presented the opportunity. It is such a good matchup. I tend to think offense wins out, but we will see because mm. defensive numbers at this stage start to carry a little bit more weight those are the four games that we have on the sweet 16 on a thursday night now we go to the games on friday when you look at the midwest region drs purdue gonzaga tennessee creighton as good of a regional semifinal slate as you will find in any portion of the bracket in any year in the big dance we start with the top team in the midwest that is number one, Purdue, against the number five seed, Gonzaga. Purdue, a five-and-a-half point favorite against the Zags. The over-under, 154-and-a-half. What do you even think we see here in this game? One that I believe is the more key matchup of Friday night. It's such a great game. It really is. And it's one of those where you're looking at the numbers where both of these teams can really score and are ultra efficient here as it plays out. You look at the effective field goal percentages also, Ben, seventh in the country for Gonzaga and 13th in the country in Purdue. It means they can stroke the three-point shot. Now, you look at Purdue, and we talked about teams that enter into the tournament. And for myself, hey, you know what? Maybe I don't want to lean on teams that require the three-point shot. So usually you say to yourself, well, Donnie, Purdue, number one in the country, 41%. If they don't shoot that number, they can't win. They don't rely on it, though, Ben. 240th in the country at firing away from three-point range. So what that tells you is if the three-pointer is open, they're going to knock it down but not going to force it because why would you with Zach 
down low. But getting a look at some of these early numbers in the week, it is a really good even matchup. The one thing I do like about Gonzaga, yeah. which is not not typical when you think about a guy like Zach Eady patrolling the paint for you here, 11th in the country at point distribution at scoring inside of the arc is Gonzaga. And you flip that over with 65th in the country at letting you score on a defensive end down low is Purdue. But I love this. If you're looking at, let's just say, Ben, pace of play, it's not going to be all that fast. The execution is going to be elite because two teams that can really shoot the three-point shot, but neither team relies on it, which again gets back to that. If it's open, they'll make it and knock it down, but nobody's just forcing three-point shots because, oh, that's what we do on offense here. I love this game, and I can't wait to watch it play out. You're right. Maybe the game of next weekend is going to be Gonzaga-Purdue. A couple of bits of movement already in both of those numbers you saw. Four and a half overnight, now five and a half. Total up by a point as well. 154 yeah. and a hook. And Zaga has gone over in both of its two games so far in the NCAA tournament. And Zaga has gone over in eight of its last 11. Again, when you look at the Zags, they were 11 and 5 in the middle of January. They have now won 16 of their last 18 games, and they have covered in their last five games victories Purdue of course in this spot trying to get to the elite eight for the first time since 2019 trying to reach a final four for the first time since 1980 next game up on Friday that we break down here is the nightcap in the Midwest region in Detroit it's the two seed Tennessee it's the three seed Creighton the volunteers right now a very slight favorite laying just two and a half points the total 143 and a half this as well a marquee matchup very short number drs how competitive is this game about to be it is going to be very competitive here now me as a cheering aspect of it i do want creighton because i have a future on creighton but from a perspective of what i think is going to take place I can't wait to watch this play out, number one, because you have Tennessee, who's a very good defensive team at the three-point line, holding their opponents to only 31%. But again, I'm looking behind the arc at Creighton, because you know me. Styles make fights, and this has worked very well here mm -hmm. throughout the conference tournaments and also March Madness. You look at Creighton on offense from a, a perspective of shooting behind the arc, very good, 37% as a team. But take a look at this, seventh in the country, close to 50% of their shots, Ben, coming from three-point range. Again, why is that important? Don, mm -hmm. he just told me that Tennessee he plays great defense behind the arc, but they let you shoot the three-point shot. For my angle for this game, certainly is going to be Creighton from behind the arc firing away against Tennessee. Yeah. And usually say, that doesn't make any sense here. They're a top three efficient defense. Why would you do anything with the offense from Creighton? Because again, Styles make fights. If I don't think that we're going to be able to score in the paint because you take a look at Tennessee, very tough to deal with, Ben. 344th in the country at letting you score out of roughly 360 plus teams. That's very good here. So the three-point arc is going to be open from Creighton. Whether they knock it down is going to be the important thing for me. But also keep in mind on this. Tennessee's offense, top 30 in the country, you know they have a great superstar score but if you want to yeah. get in the paint and bang with Creighton you can do that two-point distribution for Creighton's defense the worst in the country so if you are Tennessee don't rely on the three-point shot which Creighton will chase you off of the three-point line forcing you into the paint they got to win down low here want to watch this game play out but early in the week I'm trying to line up some Creighton three-point props here no doubt about that Ben when you look at Creighton shooting the three, Baylor Shireman, their leading scorer. Dalton mm -hmm. Connect on the other side. Steven Ashworth can light it up from three as we saw there late in the game against Oregon on Saturday night. Creighton trying to reach a Final Four for the first time in program history under Rick Barnes, who has been the head coach in Knoxville since 2015. He has now led the Vols to six straight NCAA tournaments, third time reaching the Sweet 16. Tennessee under Rick Barnes has never seen the Elite Eight. Up next, it is Duke and Houston. The 1-4 matchup in the South region on Friday night. It's the nightcap in Dallas. Four and a half point spread in favor of the Cougs. A total of 133 and a half. DRS, Duke has gone under in both of its games here in the NCAA tournament. They held Vermont to 47 points and JMU just 55 yesterday night. In fact, as you look at Duke, They've had a couple of bad losses, you could say, down the stretch. To Wake and the court storming incident, of course, in Winston-Salem. Regular season finale against North Carolina. And then bounce in the ACC tournament against NC State. But outside of that, Duke has won nine of those 12 games. And they have gone under in all nine wins. They have covered in all nine wins. But now an underdog against Houston. 
Yeah, cheering on Houston again is my top seed here to try to win a national championship. It's had the most money invested on them. And if you would have told me before the tournament, hey, Donnie, Sweet 16, Houston's going to play Duke, I'd say sign me up here because I don't know how Duke got there, but I know Houston has probably been pretty dominant all the way through. And quite frankly, I was surprised a little bit that Duke even got to this point here as I had them getting knocked off by a team that got knocked out in round one in Wisconsin. But if we're lining this up, like Duke is a very good offense, we know that. Houston and Iowa State have been battling for that top line of being the number one most efficient defense in the country. But Houston has shown some vulnerabilities here as of late. But putting it into terms of makes sense, Houston usually lives off fouling a lot here. Duke is going to be able to protect the basketball. They're top 25 in the country, Ben, at not turning the ball over. So when you see Houston's defense is privy on, yes, we don't rebound all that well because, quite frankly, you might not even get a shot off because we're either fouling you and or stealing the basketball from you. I don't think that's going to be the case in this game. But if you look at the metrics going down, top 11 in the country at defending the three-point line, top three in the country at defending inside of the arc, But early on in the week, rooting for Houston, but I got to tell you, I've really liked what I've seen from Duke, and Duke has the type of team that matches up fairly well on offense against Houston's defense. So early lean towards Duke, even though I don't want to lean towards Duke, I got to go that way. We (laughs) talked about this before the tournament. Don't be afraid to bet against teams, even though you have a lot of futures on one side. I'm not happy with this draw right now for Houston, hoping they win, but it's a pretty good matchup for Duke early. You look at things metrically, and sometimes you just paint the path of what it looks like stylistically. Didn't work for me yesterday in some of my handicaps as we had unexpected outcomes from teams that have been doing something for 32-plus games, but that's neither here nor there. We're previewing and looking forward to the Sweet 16. The first matchup on Friday is the most lopsided, at least in seed line, in this second weekend. That's Marquette, the two seed in the South region, and NC State, the 11 seed. They have won seven consecutive games. They have covered outright in six of those seven. They have won outright in every game booked as an underdog. That's five. NC State is getting six and a half points against Marquette. The total in the low 150s. DRS, how do you break down this matchup between the Golden Eagles and the Wolfpack? Yeah, it's, it's tough to handicap some of these games where one team is just incredibly hot at the right time. You know, you're betting yeah. against NC State in the ACC tournament because, like, come on now, just play back-to-back nights. Can they win a third straight night? Oh, come on. They can't afford- Oh, come on. They can't win. Yes, they did. They kept winning and also now winning in the NCAA tournament. But I like the way Marquette has been playing. However, my betting strategy early in the week here again is going to look towards NC State from the three-point line. Not a great three-point shooting team at about 139th in the country, shooting about 35% as a team. But the one thing we know about Marquette's defense, the three-point line is vulnerable for them. 338th in the country, letting you fire away from three-point range. That's my angle in this one. I do think Marquette's the better team, but we're not betting better team right now. You're betting the team that's playing the best at the end of the regular season. It's hard to argue. That's not NC State then. So when you're looking at NC State, and maybe you use the Ken Palm numbers or whatever stats you do, I would use Bart Torvik. He does great work, and he has things that you can update in a recent time frame. Because NC State, 22nd most efficient team in the country over the last two weeks since their wins in the NCAA tournament. We end out the second hour next. the rim only on sports grid the betting in game there's a big difference right like the the computer changes the number so often like i tried to get this in right now but in reality as i saw plus 165 in the arena they're hitting the shot and i'm getting this like a couple of seconds late and even the sports book like technology can only like travel so fast Sports Rage Late Night, only on Sports Grid.
Your gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on sports grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. Backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All you've heard me say on the network is, you're either winning in game live all access. Nobody has been more profitable as a dog than Shaka Smart team. Winning back to back road games. I, I don't care if they're playing Topeka high. I, I wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever. In game live prime time. Back to back just utterly stinker quarters. In game live overtime. Honestly, as, as you sit here and listen, watch right now, you may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on sports grid live right here on the early line rounding out our second hour together on this monday morning all across the sports grid network he is donnie right side i am ben stevens the rs in the round of 32 we saw favorites in large part really dominate whether that was a higher seed or a lower seed it did not matter if you were laying points you were more than likely winning the game outright and also probably covering a number we only saw one underdog win outright and that was Clemson. I'll go back and make sure I have those numbers correct. But one underdog outright out of 16 games in the round of 32 for a tournament we know as the Madness. And we saw two one seeds yesterday win and win by a ton. Purdue by 39. UConn continues to roll in the big dance. They blasted Northwestern by 17. So who has looked like the more dominant side so far? They're opening two games in the big dance. That was the question for the people out there and fade the public. So which team has been more impressive through two NCAA tournament games, Purdue or Connecticut? That was the question for you in Fade the Public, and it should not really be a surprise that most of the public, more than 70% of the public, is looking firmly DRS at Dan Hurley's Huskies. Yeah, a lot of this has to do with, again, what they did last year, which I know you're not supposed to look at, but just the scariness of UConn, how they tore through the tournament last year. And then, quite frankly, for me, again, wire to wire, probably the best team overall in college basketball, exerted their dominance in the college tournament, come out against Stetson and have them down like 40 right off the bank. And then that Northwestern game, which was 75 to 58, but it didn't even feel like it was even that close at that point. It felt like a 40-win blowout, again, against a quality team in Northwestern. So for me, it was an easy vote on UConn, even. Even though Purdue has been sensational in this tournament, I'm still going back to last year, the culmination of this year, and the tournament. It's got to be UConn for me. I mean, it's hard to say it's not Connecticut. And again, some of that, I believe, is because they are the reigning national champs. We'll give you the numbers, what it says about this year, what it says about Connecticut's continued run of the big dance when hour three starts in 55 seconds.